Hello, everybody. I am Natasha McBean. I'm at Western University in Canada. And today on this Ames Primer, I'm going to be talking to you about data assimilation uh, as a suite of methods for improving land surface model predictions. So first up, we're going to start by what is a land surface model? Uh, in this case, we're talking about um, the models that form the land component of Earth system models, shown in this schematic here on the right. Um, that's, they comprise of land components, ocean and sea ice components, continental ice sheets, all interacting together with atmospheric circulation. Sometimes uh, land surface models are also called terrestrial biosphere models, or terrestrial ecosystem models or dynamic global vegetation models. And those terms are used roughly interchangeably. So a land surface model uh, depicts all the terrestrial ecosystem processes, the physical, biogeochemical and biological processes. Uh, they contain hydrology cycles, energy balance, biogeochemical cycles such as carbon and nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as depictions of human activities such as agriculture, land use and land cover change, and increasingly uh, different uh, land management strategies as well. They are global scale. They predict uh, global scale land surface processes and interactions with, with other parts of the Earth system model. They're used primarily, but not only for historical and future climate change projections. Um, and they are developed from a range of different fields, um, such as um, the hydrology community, catchment hydrology community, um, the forest gap community, the ecological modeling community, all have contributions into these um, large scale land surface or terrestrial biosphere models. This is a, just a schematic showing these the kinds of different processes that are involved here. Uh, carbon cycle over here, hydrology cycling uh, through plants and soils here, surface energy balance, as well as larger scale processes um, between different um, parts of the um, system, such as river routing and runoff, flooding, um, irrigation of crops, other land management activities as well, um, and long, longer term vegetation dynamics related to land cover change, land use change, but also longer term species interactions um, uh, resulting in, in changes in vegetation type over time. There's been a long history of land surface modeling back from the 70s. These land surface models initially formed the lower boundary layer condition um, of the atmospheric general circulation models. And as such, they started out as just uh, calculating the surface energy fluxes. Over time, uh, more and more processes were added as we realized we needed to know more and more um, about the land surface interactions in order to, to be able to model the climate. And so these models have lots of sources of uncertainty. Some uh, source of uncertainty is from the parameters in the model, that is the fixed values of the model. Uh, we'll give an example in just a minute, um, but that's also how we link those parameters to the broad plant functional types that we use in these models. And these plant functional types group all the different species of plants um, over the whole globe into uh, relatively few groups based on their phenology, structure, function, etc. So it's how we link those different parameter values to those, those plant functional types. Then there's often uncertainties in the model structure from missing processes, uh, processes that are included but may not be well represented, um, or just from uncertainty in our process understanding. Uncertainty also in the climate forcing, the meteorological drivers used to run the model, as well as initial conditions, which I will come back to uh, uh, in just a minute. There's often a trade-off between complexity in the model, just how much, uh, how many different processes we have in the model and uncertainty. So what is data assimilation and, and why do we want to use it uh, with land modeling? So data assimilation refers to a set of techniques uh, within a Bayesian framework. And the idea here is that we're using new information, in this case, from observations 
to update our prior knowledge. And in this case, that is our theory of the processes that we encode into these global scale process-based land surface models. And the idea then is that we obtain the most optimal estimate. And by optimal, we mean we're considering uncertainties in both the observations and the model. So we're not just tuning the model uh, to try and fit the observations, we're taking into account some of the uncertainty in the model and in the data itself. And our overall goal is to quantify the uncertainty on the estimate, i.e. the model prediction, and to reduce that uncertainty by better fitting the model to the data. There's two main data assimilation approaches shown by these schematics here. One, we can class a whole group of methods as smoothers or as variational DA approaches. And the idea here is that we use all the observations in a given time window, and we use the, all those observations to constrain the model simulations. Another group of DA approaches is, can be termed the filters or sequential DA approach. And the idea here is that uh, we use the observations shown in black here to update the model shown in this blue curve here, whenever we have an observation that becomes available. So as you can see here, the model uh, continues to run. And when we get an observation, we, we nudge the model a little bit, taking into account, again, uncertainties in both to get the most optimal estimate in between the model and the observations. We continue to run the model forward until we get another observation. In this uh, set of approaches, the variational approach where we use all the observations in a given time window, our point really is to optimize the initial conditions of the model. And this approach is also used to optimize those parameters or the fixed values of the model that stay the same throughout that whole uh, assimilation time window. So that's why we can use all the observations from that whole assimilation window um, in order to optimize the parameters and initial conditions. What we do is define a cost function with these variational approaches shown by this equation here. Um, this is a typical form of this cost function. It represents the misfit between the model and the data. Uh, it looks complicated, but it's really not that scary. We have what we call an observation term here, but this is really the misfit between the model and the data. Um, accounting for these different parameter values by this uh, vector X here, but crucially this R matrix here represents the uncertainty in both the observations and the model. And again, because it's a Bayesian system, we have a prior term that represents um, our prior knowledge on our parameter values, um, as well as this B matrix here, which represents our uncertainties on those um, prior parameter estimates. And we have a range of different methods that we use here to try and minimize this cost function, find the minimum of the cost function, which represents the best fit between the observations and the data, given our prior knowledge, um, and again, accounting for uncertainties in both the observations and model and in our prior knowledge. Again, um, as I mentioned, with these sequential approaches, we optimize, instead of optimizing the model parameters, we optimize the model states at each time step. So this can be the predictions that the, that the model is making, and I'll give an example of that in just a minute. There's also a, a whole range of approaches that use ensembles, uh, ensembles of model projections in order to, um, to work out the, the error on the model um, estimates themselves um, and to better match the models with the observations. And this is a, a way uh, of approaches that can be used with both um, the variational and the sequential approaches. This land surface models are used by different communities and these data assimilation approaches um, are used for a range of different means uh, and different purposes. So for the numerical weather prediction communities that use these land surface models um, and for the climate reanalysis communities, they are mostly using this sequential data assimilation approach. But when we're using land surface models within Earth system models for making long-term climate change projections, uh, most of the work that has been done to date, but not all, but most of it has been to optimize the parameters of the model, specifically as they relate to the carbon cycle processes and carbon initial uh, stocks in the model. Again, exceptions to that rule, but generally that's what's happened. 
So one example for constraining parameters in these models uh, relates to the leaf phenology. And this is a set of processes in the model that describe when the leaves start growing um, and when they start to senesce in the fall, if they are deciduous trees. And this is motivated by studies such as this um, plot shown on the left here, which has a whole range of different model uh, simulations of the leaf area index or the amount of leaf area per unit surface ground um, from different models in all those cur colored curves compared to the observations in white dots and the black curve here. You can see that um, you know, there's a range of different dates when the models start to grow leaves, um, a range of different leaf area magnitudes, and a range of different times when the leaves start senescing in the fall. And this impacts all the different processes in the model, from the amount of carbon uptake to the amount of, of water cycling through the plants and the surface energy balance. When we're constraining leaf phenology parameters, we might be constraining parameters such as temperature thresholds that start the leaves growing um, or temperature or moisture thresholds that start the leaves senescing in the fall. And why do we care about the initial conditions in the model? Uh, one of the reasons here is that with these big global scale land surface models, we start them running from almost a bare rock um, as a concept. We don't have any vegetation or soil as we start these um, model runs. And what we do is we cycle over historical climate and we build up the carbon in the soil and the vegetation stores through thousands of years of um, model simulations, uh, much as, as it happens in, in reality um, with the um, increase of um, soil buildup and plant growth over time. But it's difficult to know over thousands of years what the past climate has been and what the exact land use history has been at that site. And therefore, the carbon in the soil and vegetation stocks is often very uh, inaccurate, um, especially when you consider global scale estimates. Um, and therefore, that really uh, impacts our predictions of how much carbon is cycling between the land and the atmosphere, and therefore how much CO2 is remaining in the atmosphere causing global warming. So this is why in earth system modeling, we also care about our initial conditions. The same is true uh, for the numerical weather prediction um, um, fields. They also need to very much care about their initial um, climate conditions in order to model and predict future weather in, in short term. And the idea then is that we have a range of different observations over different temporal and spatial scales. Um, these is as an example showing here different observations that can be used for constraining the carbon cycle um, from remote sensing to eddy covariance towers, tall tower atmospheric CO2 network, etc. And we're trying to combine all these different types of observations into this kind of data assimilation system. This schematic here is showing you an example of a data, a variational data simulation system for the Orchidae land surface model that is part of the IPSL Earth system model. And so the, the idea here then is that we have our prior parameter values, typically the default values of the model, things like the temperature threshold to start the leaves growing, as I mentioned just before. Um, we have the, uh, the model processes. Um, we have our observed data here. We often also have what we call observation operators that link uh, the observations to what we're modeling, because um, often we, we observe things that are not exactly the same in the model. And that is another source of uncertainty. We combine all of this into this cost function that I mentioned to you just before and use a range of different methods to minimize that cost function. And then of course we have optimized parameters and uncertainties and um, optimized um, observation operators as well as we've constrained them and optimize state variables of the model, the things that we're trying to predict with the model, such as the leaf phenology, as I mentioned before, the leaf area index in that case. An example of using um, variational data simulation to improve the model is shown in this plot here. This is a study um, using SIF data, solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence data, which is a proxy of gross carbon uptake by plants. Uh, we have here an amine seasonal cycle for C4 grasses. Uh, the prior model is shown in this blue curve here. You can, and the observations are in these uh, starred values over time. 
the optimized model is then shown in this orange curve over here. So this is a variational data assimilation system. We've used all these observations in this time window to optimize parameters, in this case related to photosynthesis, phenology, and uh, fluorescence in the model. And by the time we've optimized those parameters, we can see that the model, the posterior model here after optimization, much better fits those observations uh, than the prior model in the blue curve did. That's the goal of what we're trying to do here. We've also got um, a quantified estimate of uncertainty on our posterior model here, shown by that light orange zone. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that we reduce that uncertainty. It's not always possible, but at least we have a better estimate of that model uncertainty related to the parameter uncertainty. An example of using state data assimilation, so this is often um, the sequential data assimilation techniques to update the model state itself, rather than uh, the parameters um, underlying those model calculations. So this is um, an example of state data assimilation here for updating um, a land surface model predictions of above ground biomass. And the prior model is shown in this red curve here. In fact, the gray curve here and the black curve is the model without any data assimilation. And the observations are in blue here. And so we've, you can see we've done this sequential um, data assimilation approach here at this observation time point. We haven't done it at every um, assimilation time point. This is just an example. And that has drawn the model predictions of the biomass down to better match the observations. And the, the resulting Posterior simulation of biomass is therefore much more closely representing the observations um, from then on. So it's an example of how we can use that kind of updating of the state data, the state in variables in the model, um, in order to improve our future predictions. In the AIMS project, our primary goal is to make sure that human activities are well represented in these land surface models. It's a huge challenge. There's a huge number of, of human activities that need to be included from agriculture, uh, irrigation, um, um, forest management, deforestation, et cetera. There's also disturbances that are going on as a result of ongoing climate change, such as bark beetle outbreaks that are very difficult to implement uh, in these models um, with a lack of sort of process understanding. And one thing we're considering in the AIMS project is bringing people together uh, from the land data assimilation communities and from the land surface modeling communities focused on incorporating human activities into land surface models to see how we can use data assimilation to better model uh, the impact of human activities um, on terrestrial biosphere and resultant feedbacks to climate. One thing that we could do here is combine the use of state data assimilation to update the model forecasts whenever we have an observation related to, for example, irrigation or deforestation um, where we can't always get the data from the ground in order to uh, drive the model with that um, land management information. And maybe we can do that in conjunction with parameter data, data assimilation in order to constrain the model parameters and result in a much better impact um, of human activities as well as natural processes on predictions of carbon sequestration, water availability, and feedbacks between the land surface and climate. Another thing that we're doing within the AIMS project is trying to build a land data simulation community to talk about a lot of the technical challenges that we face when building these land data simulation systems. There's a lot of detail in setting the model and observation errors, um, as well as the methods used for constraining those cost functions uh, that require a lot of, of, of building of the data simulation systems themselves. So we formed this land data community website. It's going to serve as a hub for all of our activities. We have a couple of workshops. Uh, we're trying to broaden out our working groups. Uh, we're trying to also put together a lot of resources on data assimilation methods. So if you're interested in any of these activities, please take a look at the website, join our listserv and get involved in our community. Thank you.